All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to start. Hi, uh, I'm Margaret Warner, and you know our distinguished panel, and I, those of you who've been here part or all of the last two days, I think we've had a just fascinating and rich presentation of a lot of aspects of this religion versus science debate. So what I'm going to try to do in this uh, next, I don't know, hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes, is to pull it all together and try to highlight some of the differences we heard. And I, I guess um, if I'm, I'm successful, maybe I'll be like the divine watchmaker. <laughs> and if I'm unsuccessful, it'll be like the blind watchmaker, <laughs> completely random. But um, with that, let's just start. Uh, one central question I think that we um, uh, heard, debated, and, and analyzed was this essential question of whether one can believe in God and in evolution. And if I, if I might, let me just say, as a layperson, here's what I heard. I mean, that there's a whole gradation uh, from a Stephen Jay Gould sort of, well, there are separate realms, to the idea put on the table by Lawrence that, well, if you, if you believe that there is a God of all causes, then even random selection could be his cause. Um, and then Alvin um, Planting just suggested you didn't call it this, but almost like a thumb on the scale, that God could set these processes in motion, but he could also kind of wait how things might turn out, or that a, that, a, that a mutation might occur, or at least be kept alive long enough to take root. And, uh, and then you could perhaps go to the Francis Collins model, which I, I think Ken discussed, that um, God set up evolution and natural selection, though, as I've read him, what he's saying is with the aim of actually ultimately producing a human-like being with whom God could actually communicate, a human being that needed God, that needed, that had consciousness, that had intellectual capacity, conceptual understanding. So, and Ken, I'd like to start with you as, as one of the scientists here. If, if there is a search for harmonizing these views, which Ron also described in, in his... Um, that there have been attempts at this before. Where could there be a convergence and still be true to science? Well, I think um, <laughs> uh, Ron's talk was, to me, especially early on, was a litany of all of the people who had tried to work for peace and harmony had gotten chewed up and spit out. <laughs> um, and I was, I was wondering what fate he would predict for me, uh, given, given those circumstances. But um, I think, essentially, um, the starting point um, is actually pretty simple. Um, and the starting point is, first of all, to respect reason. Um, the, uh, the, the Western religious tradition, the Abrahamic tradition, um, views faith and reason both as gifts from God. And we look into the founding of science. We look into the, the history of science in the West. And we see that the scientific enterprise actually comes out of the Abrahamic tradition of studying nature through rational means to the greater glory of God. Now, you don't have to be a person of faith to appreciate the fact that this um, uh, reverence for rationality, if you will, is built into the Western mind and comes out of the Western conception of religion, and to appreciate and to respect that. And I think the first thing that is incumbent upon religious people to do um, is basically to respect reason, and, 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 and ultimately science is reason and rationality practically applied. What's incumbent upon this, the people in the scientific tradition do, to do is to recognize, recognize that Western rationality comes out of Western religious thought. And even if they themselves um, reject a personal God or a spiritual life or any other sort of God, to reflect the fact that this tradition of reason is bound into basically the Western religious tradition. And therefore, the attempts to understand religion and science as being complementary are very, very much in the historic tradition of science and to be respected and to some extent to be appreciated, if not always to be agreed with. Let, let me... Uh, Actually, let me first okay. go to, to, to Alvin Plantinga. Do you see an opening there? It, and if so, is it in a sort of Excuse reverence? Me, do I what? Do you, see, do you see an opening there? And oh, if yeah. so, do you think it's where Ken Miller sees it? Um, well, I, I agree very much with what Ken just said now and also very much with what he said of what he said uh, with what he said in his lecture, which kind of surprised me. I'd never met him before, and although I'd heard these distant rumblings about Ken Miller and what he said about the ideas and the like of that, I didn't really know what he thought. 
So I was uh, pleasantly surprised there. And I agree with him on this last point, and I would carry it further, really. It's not, I would say, just that science grew out of the matrix, was conceived and born out of the womb of uh, Christian belief. I'm inclined to think that um, science can't really seri be seriously sustained without some similar kinds of beliefs. I don't think science fits at all well with naturalism, the idea that there isn't any such person as God or anything like God. I mean, science um, grew out of the matrix of Christian belief in, in two separate ways. First of all, uh, according to Christian belief, God created the world. God is a person, an intelligent person, and created it in a rational, reasonable, sensible way. And secondly, he created human beings in his image, an important part of which is their being able to, to know the world and to know something about themselves and to know something about God himself. And science is just a, um, a sort of prime, um, extremely glittering, important example of that. So, uh, so I, I would like to, uh, I'd like to see Ken on this point and raise him one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ron. Well, I just wanted to say it's a popular and pleasant Christian conceit that uh, Western rationality uh, and science uh, came out of the Abrahamic or maybe the, the Christian tradition even, but aren't we uh, sort of marginalizing uh, what the Greeks did who weren't Christians or children of Abraham? No, I, no, I, I don't think so. And, and boy, boy, boy uh, Lawrence can appreciate this. Boy, am I scared. I'm now talking about the origin of science. I'm between a historian and a philosopher. And for, <laughs> for natural science, this is a terrifying position to be in. Um, but I think what one has to look at in terms of Western, uh, Western religious and intellectual life are the various attempts that especially Christian theologians made to harmonize Greek philosophy and Greek understanding. I mean, the great project of Thomas Aquinas was basically to take the works of Aristotle and Plato and Christianize them in one sense or another, to use Greek rationality as the ultimate basis for Christian belief. And I would, I would argue, and I'm not a historian, so I am certainly subject to being slapped down by the historians in the room, um, but I would argue that the reason that science as we know it developed in the West and not in the East where you had civilizations that in many ways were much more technologically advanced than Western Europe in the Middle Ages, was because of the Abrahamic view of man, seeing man as something apart from nature. In other words, the ability to step outside of nature and try to look at it as an objective observer is very much in the Western intellectual tradition, the Abrahamic tradition. The Eastern tradition, as I understand it, always views man as entangled with nature, as part of it, and therefore even the idea of, an, of, of setting up an experiment, which you can try to observe, observe objectively, um, it doesn't, doesn't emerge out of these. So, so I, I sort of stand by that point until, as I say, I'm slapped down by a historian who knows this uh, better So you'll than defend I. the proposition that the Greeks were not rational. No, I will defend the, the, the proposition that Western Abrahamic thought um, merged with the intellectual traditions of the Greeks to, to the extent that Western thought was able to do that um, and, and fused into a system of rational thought in which science became possible. Right, we have some other people dying to jump in here, Lawrence. Let me, if he's not going to slap you down, let me slap you down, Ken. Um, <laughs> For two things he said. First of all, it's nice to talk about historical tradition, but the great thing about science is it's kind of ahistorical. And, and you know, you, it, it's, it may have, it may have, um, sorry about that, Ron. But, uh, I mean, that, that, the point is that to understand the science, you don't have to understand the history. It's very, it's very illuminating, but, it, but you don't need to. But the point about history is one moves beyond. I mean, the, the, the other tradition of, the, 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 the theological tradition of Christianity might have been ancient Egypt and the sun god, but, but you don't think, you don't say, boy, I'm really happy that, um, that we have that as a basis for modern Christianity. And the point is that many scientists would say that, well, that, while your argument may be, may be historically correct, and I, I think there are key historical issues of what you said, it's irrelevant that science has, in fact, taken us beyond religion. And in fact, uh, the, the line that I used from Steve Weinberg, I think is really important. That's, and in fact, it's why I completely disagree with what you just said, Alvin, that, 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 that science, in some sense, needs religion. Science, and I think it's the, the most important thing about science, is that it makes it possible to not believe in God. That it, re, it, it, that it means, if you wish, that you can, you can that, that not everything in life is miraculous, that actually effects have real causes that you can understand. And if you, uh, it, 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 what the, the real 
compatibility between science and religion, it seems to me, is ultimately uh, maybe uh, the one that we talked about for the Catholic Church that you just mentioned, the ca cause of all causes, the, the, uh, the sense of making God completely invisible and therefore completely scientifically irrelevant. And therefore, the only compatibility I can see is when so God becomes completely scientifically irrelevant so that scientists have nothing to say about God other than their own metaphysical uh, uh, predilections. And that, and that the natural world they can study without being a threat to those people who, who believe fundamentally that there's design and purpose to the world, but uh, that, uh, that God isn't required to to. to tinker at all because, in fact, there's no evidence that he's tinkering, or she's tinkering, forgive me. I, I, I want to take issue a little bit with the idea that reason may be the primary uh, basis or, or for common ground between uh, religion and science, because although one can certainly make that argument and see it in, in the case of uh, a lot of scientists and then the attempts, at least by intelligent design people, to bring reason into the picture, what I sense, and remember I'm the sociologist here, so my world is pretty much the grassroots world, kind of talking to people, you know, Kansas, Ohio, places like that. What I see is more of a, of a sense of convergence is an aesthetic appreciation. I, it was interesting, Ken, that you said that people appreciate reason. That suggests to me that there is an aesthetic evaluation of what's happening with knowledge of different kinds, where the reason involved may be quite different. But as I hear people on the religious side who are trying to come to terms with, okay, how shall we understand science, they're often saying, well, I'm really impressed by the mystery of it all or by the awe of nature or by wonder. And then what they find on the science side that kind of says to them, oh, you know, we can get along with these people, are some of the same things. When Francis Collins talks and writes, that's often the language he uses. And when other scientists talk about insight or intuition as part of the scientific process, then I notice again that a lot of people relate to that. So it may be that we're ironically moving beyond some of the faith in reason, at least that characterized the Enlightenment, or at least faith in rationalism, to something that's tempering reason uh, a little bit, at least. What about the uh, theory, and I'll take whoever would like to, to speak on this. Some physicists have suggested, it's called the theory of everything, that science and religion actually coalesce in the structure of the universe. And I think Stephen Hawking in Brief History of Time sort of touches on this. And that um, you mentioned Francis Collins, that when he went to the White House in 2000, along with Craig Venter, to announce the first sort of rough draft mapping of the human genome, he said, it is humbling for me and awe-inspiring to realize we have caught the first glimpse of our own instruction book, previously known only to God. In other words, he was trying to be very careful to say, that, well, I, I, should, I won't even paraphrase him, I'll let his words stand, but it almost seems to be going back to the, I don't know, 14th, 15th century idea that, that in the Judeo-Christian, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ron, here, but that God had created the world according to sort of, sort of divine mathematical plan or divine plan, which might be called the laws of nature, and that to try to understand that plan was to try to decipher the mind of God, and that therefore there wasn't a conflict. And I. I I'm just wondering, does this theory of everything, are we moving back to that? Anymore? Well, actually, I think we're, it, as a physicist, I want to clarify one thing. In some sense, we're move, almost moving away from that, in a, in a sense that many people would find dangerous. The, the long tradition of science and, and, uh, is that the, the sense that the, the universe had to be the way it is. There's only one possible set of physical laws that hang together that produce a workable universe, and our job was kind of to discover them. And that's certainly what, what Einstein meant when he unfortunately often used the term God because he certainly didn't believe in a kind of God that a personal a God that had any personal interest in human in human affairs but and and so I think scientists inevitably have that kind of basic belief if you want to call it that that there is some rational there are ra rational rules that that govern the world, and that if we had a theory of everything, we would understand why the universe is the way it is interestingly enough 
what's happened in the last years is, is the failure to, to get anywhere near that has led to a, an opposite perspective, that in fact there may be no rules that govern the universe fundamentally, and, and that our universe is one of perhaps an infinite number of universes in which each one of which has different physical laws, and we just happen to be an environmental accident. It's kind of the ultimate form of evolution, if you wish, because it says that why are we living in this universe? Because life can live in this universe. We'd be living in another universe, except life can't live in that one. It's, you know, why bees like honey, and et cetera. It's, 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 it's sort of almost in the extreme version of, of evolution in a cosmic sense, but it would say, in some sense, that there's, there's not, not even any fundamental rational framework that explains why our universe is the way it is. It's just an accident. But, but there's, a, there's a really interesting um, corollary, a way to look at what Lawrence just brought up. Um, uh, and what he referred to is generally known as the multiple universe hypothesis. Um, for example, there's a, a wonderful book, um, I believe it's by Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, called Just Six Numbers. And Rees talks about six numbers, many of which are ratios, so I think he's kind of cheating because he's using two numbers in the ratio, um, where he talks about fundamental constants of nature, and if any of them were just a little bit different, uh, we probably wouldn't be here. So he says these six numbers. Now, he's not a theist, but he points out that the universe really depends upon this coincidence of physical constants. So one way to look at this, as he admits, is to say, well, uh, you could interpret that by saying that there was a creator who set these things up so that we could be here. But then there's another way to look at it, which Lawrence just pointed out, which is we're alive. We're all here today. So, duh, of course we live in a universe that makes life possible, because if this universe didn't make life possible, there'd be no Terry Lectures, and there'd be nobody here to talk about it. So that's yeah. the other side of the coin. But the curious theological leap that has always struck me about the multiple universe hypothesis is that many people um, who um, are agnostic or atheist criticize anyone in science for being a theist by saying, you know, you've reduced God to the point where there's absolutely no evidence. There's nothing testable. He's become, as Lawrence just said, invisible. Well, you know, the curious thing about the multiple universe hypothesis is that all those parallel universes, by definition, you can't communicate with them, you can't test them, you can't uh, have evidence for them either, so they've become invisible. So there is a quasi-theological element to that argument and that I think many people in science find very disturbing. Yeah, it right. does concern yeah. some of us. Alan I, I, wanted to jump in. Yeah, cool. yeah uh, well, I want to jump in at some previous point here. With respect to, um, I wanted to comment um, briefly on something Ken said early on about reason. I mean, um, it is true, it seems to me, that science, that science presupposes two things, that the universe is in some sense reasonable, rational, has a certain structure. Even if it's a multiverse, there is still a certain kind of structure in each of the, multi, in each of the uh, sub universes and for the whole multiverse too, there's a certain kind of structure. There's got to be a, something that generates these different uh, multi, multi uh, universes in the whole multiverse and the like. But uh, one interesting thing about modern Western science, as opposed to the Greeks, and this is addressed to something Ron said, is that modern Western science is heavily empirical. Uh, perception counts for a great deal, empirical perception, much more so than for the Greeks. For the Greek science was much more a priori. That is, it was much more a matter of figuring things out without actually taking a look, but just, be, just being able to think them through, think them out. Now, one Christ, important Christian doctrine is the doctrine of creation, according to which God created the world and was free not to. He wasn't obliged to. So it's not a necessary truth that he created the world. And given that he created it, it's not a necessary truth that he created it the way it's been created. It could have been many other ways. And, the way in, and that means that if it's not a necessary truth that it's this way, it's a contingent truth. And the contingent is the realm of um, what we philosophers laughingly call a posteriori thought. That is, not a priori, not prior to perception, but involving perception. You have to go out and take a look. You can't, as some of the Aristotelian medieval uh, Aristotelian scientists were accused of, not wanting, they wanted to know how many teeth a horse had in its mouth. They didn't want to look, they wanted to try to deduce it from first principles. That's the sort of <laughs> Greek approach. Whereas the Christian approach would be to say, well, God could have done it any number of ways, let's, go, let's see how he did do it. I wanted to look at uh, questions about, uh, well, first of all, I think these are questions that science, natural science doesn't answer for us. And I, there seemed to be general agreement that science does not explain the meaning of life or whether there's meaning to life or, or why are we here. 
But it seemed to me, again, as a layperson, that um, maybe all of you were saying, well, but things in the physical realm are explained by science or, or remain to be explained by science. My question is, has science ever explained or, or proven that how intelligent life might evolve from unintelligent life, unconscious life? Yeah, natural selection, I think it's called. Um, you do? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it's certainly, it, it, what, depends what you mean by proven. The, the, yeah, you proven actually, is the wrong word. No, no, it's very important that we get this clear here. I, I tried to say it the other day, but I want to reemphasize here. Science doesn't prove things to be right. It, that's a big misconception. It can never prove anything to be right. It can only prove things to be wrong. That's its great strength. So it, if you sh it, what, what, what you can show is that something doesn't work. If it works, you don't know if it's true. You just know it's not false. And so uh, what, what natural selection is provided uh, via evolution is a mechanism that plausibly and, in fact, predictably explains the diversity of all life that we've observed on Earth, including human life and including... Um, uh, intelligent life. Now, do we understand all the detailed mechanisms? Absolutely not. But the keep one of the big fallacies in this big debate with evol with a lot of the ID people is that just just because you don't understand something doesn't mean you don't understand anything. And 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 so there's a lot we don't understand, and that's why we like to do science. But but you know because we don't understand, not because we understand. So I think natural selection has provided a perfectly plausible mechanism that also satisfies every experimental test that we've ever performed and therefore at this point there's no reason to to expect that it won't be able to explain the evolution of intelligence. But Bob or Ron, is that where much of the public, and we, we heard some, some interesting polling numbers from Bob early on, that's the choke point for much of the public that they might accept that uh, you know a fish could grow into a land mammal but it's it's the creation of, a, or the evolution, or whatever uh, verb you want to use, the emergence of what we consider human qualities of, of, of awareness, self-awareness, sense of right and wrong. Is that where the, the problem is? Yeah, for, for a lot of the public, the issue is, okay, however we got here, and you know, frankly, a lot of the public really doesn't care, and that may be one reason why we have these, these debates, because they're easily <laughs> persuaded by whoever you know, comes along. But they'll say, okay, now that we're here and we clearly have consciousness, and therefore some things that seem to go along with consciousness, thought, culture, the arts, morality, and so forth, and presumably, again, we're trying to be kind of speciest, and so we want to be different from other species, so we, we as humans assume that other species don't have consciousness, or at least assume if they do, then it's different somehow from, from ours. And so we do a great deal to kind of try to figure out what that means. The more thoughtful of us will say, well, does that in any way change the dynamics of natural selection, that we can think and choose and destroy ourselves or not destroy ourselves, save ourselves, invent things, and so forth. Or others will say, well, you know, this is, this is just something that happened in a long, long series of evolution, and it will continue to happen, and so maybe what we think now as the high point is just the fact that we happen to be able to think about it, whereas, you know, later uh, other species or whatever comes afterwards uh, will view things, if they view things at all, in a very different way. Now, I think where, where it really hits home to a lot of the public is when they think about, when we think about our own existence. So, yes, how we came into being is one of the questions, but where we're headed, especially as individuals, is the big question. We're going to die. We know that. And, you know, religion for centuries has provided all sorts of answers. We're going to go to heaven, and we're going to live with God, and we're going to sing, and we're going to be with angels, and we're going to see our relatives who have passed on before us. Um, I think if we really wanted to stir up big conflict between religion and science, all we'd have to do is have, you know, the scientific community come out strongly and say, when you're dead, you're dead. That's it. There's nothing else, and think about it, absorb it. Um, but I'm not sure that, 
In the, in the American public, over 70% of the public believes in life after death, and that number has actually increased over the last several decades. Yeah, the debate has been very much, or the search for common ground about the God, the creator role, but there's the God, the redeemer. And I mean, is science, is that a frontier that science is going to address? Well, I, I, uh, let me jump First in here trying to address? As, as a biologist and confirm that biologically, when you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> Science has said that for a long time. I mean, please, <laughs> come on. Um, and, 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 and no one in science, uh, to my knowledge, has ever expressed the competence of science to talk about the reality or the unreality of a spiritual life after death. So I think everybody knows um, whether they're believers or not, that this is not something that science is going to tell us. Well, science oh, is not going to... Didn't Carl I, I, Sagan agree. say something about that? I'm, 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 I'm sure Carl Sagan did, but I remember being old enough to remember that when Yuri Gagarin, the first man to orbit the Earth, orbited the Earth, they asked him, what did you see up there? And he said, I didn't see no angels. Um, and what he was talking about is the very naive belief that religious people believe that God's standing on top of a cloud somewhere. But well, science sorry. could do negative... I mean, but you know as well as I do, you could at least... You can search for positive evidence and, and, and find a lack thereof. You know, the many experiments looked at the way people when they died to see if the, if the spirit was oh. in any way. I mean, so, so there are questions <laughs> that people can ask and have asked. And so, again, as I said earlier, the lack of evidence, you know, absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. Oh, that's, that's but, exactly but, right. But, but, but yeah. please don't forget to apply that to religion as much as we do to science. Hey, Ron. I just wanted to go back to your earlier uh, question about what people believe and what bothers them. I think you're, you're right about the origin of life, and I think that, that in terms of attitudes toward evolution, they're rather surprising. The stricter you are as a creationist, the more evolution you have to admit. And that's because of the flood, among other things. Because uh, of the what? Because of Noah's flood. You of believe flood. that there was a flood that eliminated all life on earth but what was in there so if you have a six to ten thousand year old world uh, then you have to have say one pair of canines producing in 4300 years roughly the foxes the coyotes the domestic dogs we have they're happy to invoke natural selection for that they don't have any objection they call this microevolution that's not a problem with these people. They have to have evolution uh, on fast forward. What really concerns them are the big breaks. Uh, matter, life, humans, and the divisions between these, these originally created kinds. So evolutionists are all the time saying, oh, we just discovered this marvelous empirical evidence of speciation. This will just shut up the creationists. In fact, it they need that. Uh, they, they don't, that doesn't bother them at all. So what we think some of these people are bothered by, many of them aren't bothered by. I'd, I'd yes. like to go back, also go back to your question, um, whether we've got some kind of explanation in evolution or anywhere else of the rise of mentality, how it is that there can be creatures who think and reason and can do physics and can do evolutionary biology and the like of that. Um, I don't. I don't think we have any explanation for that. It's not that. It's not that exactly. Um, evolution hasn't provided an explanation for it. We just can't see how it could be, as it seems to me, how a piece of matter of some sort, a brain, lots of neurons clicking away together, how how that could amount to could be the same thing as or produce or be such as to have thought supervene on it. So there's this, um, this three and a half pounds of brain of meat there clicking away, lots of neurons. I don't know how many there's some 10 to the 11th um, neurons and so on. They're connected in various interesting ways and the like. How does that amount to thought? How does that somehow bring it about that I can um, experience red? How can my experiencing red just be some kind of brain activity of that sort? Seems to me we don't have any explanation for you that. You don't, we don't, but do you, you surely aren't suggesting we won't. We don't have any explanation for that, and I don't think we ever will either, oh. because what we'll find will be <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's <laughs> what we'll find will be correlations. We'll find that, uh, as we have found to some degree now, that when somebody thinks a certain thought, a certain part of his brain lights up. I mean, there's more electrical activity there, more blood flow to that, and so on. But that doesn't show us at all how 
these electrons, are, I mean, these um, neurons influencing each other, electrical uh, signals going back and forth, how that could somehow engender or just be an experience, an experience of red or something like that. I don't, I don't think we're going to find much by way of an explanation of that. I, uh, Alvin, 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 I think what you've done, and you've done it well, is to state what I would regard as the fundamental problem in neuroscience, uh, which is how does associative intelligence work? How does the brain work? Um, and I don't know of a single researcher in neuroscience who is not motivated by a desire to answer the questions that you just threw out there. Um, but here's the proposition I want to throw right back to you. Here's okay. the, the or throw it right back to you. I have a question. Do you sorry. think for a moment that the question of cognition, how do you see red, or the question of sensation, how do I know it's cold, or the question of thought, how do I decide what I want to say next, will not, at some point, ultimately be accounted for by the physics and the chemistry and the cell biology of the organ we call the brain. Well, and would you well, go as, could I just add, would you go as far as the appreciation of beauty, of yeah, art, of, of music? I mean, would I, you I, add I, all of that? Don't get me wrong. I don't think, we're, I don't think there's going to be a paper in science next week that's going to say no, we work out the no, circuitry no, but of beauty. I mean, but what I'm talking awesome. about is we, we are physical creatures. And the brain works according to the laws, as I say, of cell biology, physics, physics, and chemistry. And I would be interested in Alvin telling us as to whether or not he thinks the ultimate answer is beyond the material matter of the brain. I certainly think it's within it, and I've, that's, what, that's what I certainly think as a scientist, and I think that's what motivates neuroscience. I'd like to hear well, the answer, Jimmy. Um, yeah. Alvin. Answer. I'd love to hear Yeah, it. I'd be, uh, um, this depends entirely on what one means by explain or account for. Um, there, there is a, a very elegant little creature named uh, C. elegans. It's a worm, and its neural circuitry has been completely mapped. So uh, you, know, you know exactly which neurons are connected. It ha doesn't have very many neurons. I think it's maybe got 114 or something like that. But I mean, I'm not sure about that. Maybe you know just how many it's got. Anyway, it's been... Uh, somebody in the audience knows. Thank you. 124. <laughs> okay. Well, I was fairly close. For, 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 for a philosopher, that wasn't bad. You know, <laughs> well, it wasn't bad even for a scientist. You were correct within an order of magnitude. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, maybe we could completely get it. I mean, it would be an enormously complex thing I mean, to have such a complete map of the whole human nervous system. But suppose we did, and suppose we knew exactly which neurons did which when somebody remembered something, when somebody thought 7 plus 5 equals 12, when somebody thought naturalism is all the rage these days and the like. Um, that wouldn't answer the question I was asking, I don't think. We still wouldn't know, well, okay, why is it that way? I mean, Do you why think is it we these won't? Other ones that, that it, why is it that these other ones? Why is it when they move in this fashion, we get, uh, we get that thought? There just isn't that kind of connection there. It'd be like we'd have to have a whole, a whole set of, you might say, uh, brute laws of some sort. I, I think you've also not enunciated the main question that motivates neurobiologists, but you've also explained extremely well why Richard Dawkins, who's been derided here, has said that many people, many religious people, um, uh, and this is his statement, not mine, but I think you've illustrated, it seems to me, give up thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm real, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be, well, I'm sorry to, to be so perturbed, but to give up the notion that we might, that it's just to suggest a priori that we'll never understand something that we don't understand when we don't even know enough to know whether, what it is to mean understanding, but to suggest in advance that there's no way of understanding it is just the antithesis of, of, of science and it seems to me it's just a defeatist attitude that, that, that uh, is to be scorned. And, and well, maybe it's a scorn, maybe it's a scorn-worthy attitude, but it still might be true. I'm not so much worried about <coughs> being scientifically correct or, <coughs> or having the right, the right um, approved attitudes. I'm just making a suggestion. I mean, if that's the way it looks. That doesn't mean people shouldn't try. Of course, they should. I, I, I think the other response to, to all of this is that let's suppose we are, in fact, able to explain it all with physics or biology or nerve circuitry or whatever, one of the things that we would probably find at that point was that we had a human need to also explain it in other ways. Yeah. To go kind of back to the Popperian. And, and where does that come from? Sure, you can reduce everything down, but it may be that part of human consciousness is that we actually have some desire for religion or transcendence or beauty or whatever, and so once the scientists have told us exactly how it works, we're going to say, yeah, but we're still going to keep thinking about it because there are other levels that we want to understand. All right, another um, 
uh, aspect of the physical world or one time the physical world that I'm wondering if science has explained. And, and let me start with Ron on this. If, is we have evidence of a Big Bang, what, 14, 15 billion years ago, and a theory that explains how life evolved from that. But what about before the Big Bang? Well, <laughs> you, don't, you, 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 are, I mean, you are a historian. An answer, right? <laughs> a historian ought to be able to have an answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're a historian, but I, I didn't want you left out of this, so. <laughs> one, one minute before the Big Bang, only God exists. No, I don't have to. <laughs> well, no, I, I... Oh, but this, this is the sort of question that lay people perpetually bring up. Well, what happened before the Big Bang? Well, uh, I don't think there's anybody here who's going to tell us what happened before the Big Bang. Do you? We, we have a scientific explanation, uh, but it's a cop-out. Uh, we say, I mean, the current best picture is that there, it's not a good question. Right. Namely, that time, right. the time is related to nature of space, and therefore <coughs> time itself may have come into existence Let me at refine the Big my question to Ron, though. What, in turning to you, this is what I meant is when the Big Bang theory came out, was this the reaction? Oh. And, oh. and what, yeah. what, what had, was the reaction to the yeah. Big Bang theory? Yes. I mean, did people well, it, it, respond by that, saying, that's well, a, that's, that's an interesting all question. well and good? Uh, Excuse me, I should have refined it. <laughs> it, it came out as a competitor to something called the steady state interpretation of the universe, which bothered a lot of Christians because it didn't seem to be really directional. So some, especially liberal Christians, embraced the Big Bang as actually verifying a notion of an initial creation. Conservative Christians tended to pass it off as just another point in the larger evolutionary scheme, and so they more more often than not just dismissed it because they knew the universe wasn't that old to begin with and it didn't help them at all. And, and, and let me underline what Ron just said because uh, I've also uh, had dialogue with conservative Christians on this issue and the, the, the first thing they say is explosions create disorder. The universe is orderly, therefore the Big Bang is nonsense. And as Lawrence pointed out the other day, um, in states where um, anti-evolution majorities have gained control of state boards of education, I think of Ohio and I think of also Kansas, in addition to going over after evolution, they also look on earth science and astronomy and they pull the Big Bang out as well. So it turns out that even though many Christians have looked at that and said, ah, the universe had a beginning, that is consonant with our theology. For many conservative Christians, they don't like it a bit. Was Pius a conservative or a liberal Christian? I mean, as I, I talked yesterday about the fact how Pope Pius immediately jumped on it and said science has proved Genesis. He was thrilled with the Big Bang. I, I don't I know think, if he was conservative I think by, the by standards, modern standards. By the standards of American conservative Christians, he any was pope is a liberal. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, probably right. Well, Lawrence, with, with that context now, what were you saying about how science is trying to address that? Or does, is science, is the scientific community not concerned with that? Concerned with I, know, I know this is a total layperson's question, yeah. but sort of put crudely, well, what caused the Big Bang? Well, look, you scientists, touched on that a little yesterday. Scientists are, as I think many, some, the purpose of science is to continue to ask questions about anything we can ask questions about and measure. Uh, l let, me, let me, so of course, the sci I mean, that's what I get paid for is worrying about that very question. And, uh, uh, you know, the context of trying to understand the Big Bang and trying to, if possible, understand if, if, that's, if there is something before or after or other than. Uh, but let me just point out something that's really important. This, this whole debate is, or not debate so much, discussion, has made it seem like this is a vital issue to scientists. And one, one of the things you should realize is that Steve Weinberg, who I quoted before and is strongly an atheist, has made it clear that most scientists don't even think enough about God to be atheists. They don't think about the issue at all. Most scientists don't even, I mean, issues of God just never come into, it, it's not under discussion. Most people don't, most, I, I have thought much more about theological issues in the last four years as I've tried to defend science against, against uh, intelligent design or, or, or attacks on science than I ever did in my period as a scientist. It just never came up. Most scientists don't have any sophisticated theological notions. They don't worry about it. It's not an issue. So that brings up the question that Bob put on the table the very first yesterday, and it, it, it concerns the question of whether this debate is healthy. I think that many of you, the undercurrent seem to be that it's, it's not healthy, it's an assault on science by 
creationists or intelligence design people, but your view was it's, it isn't happening enough and that these cases, as extreme and sort of oversimplified as they are, and the media covers them in an oversimplified way, to which I think we'd all plead guilty, that they're actually healthy because they force us to confront some really profound questions about the nature of our existence that we otherwise wouldn't. So I'd just like to throw that on the table about, is this debate healthy? Do we all agree with Ron that it's, it's going to continue? And, um, you know, if so, is that a good thing? And is there a way to shape it so that it's a more productive exercise? Well, I, I guess I want to qualify what parts of the debate I think might be good and might be useful to continue and others that, that are not. Now, uh, several of, of, of the folks here have pointed out quite rightly, I think, that yeah, for serious science, this is, this is a big distraction. You know, why, why should anybody who's got, got the training and the power and everything to do good science waste their time on, on this stuff? Now, it's, it's wonderful that you and you and, you know, several others around the country have taken the time to address these, you know, intelligent design debates and so forth. But in terms of getting on with science, yeah, you're right, you know, God is, is not a, a big issue, and not even some of these particular issues that the intelligent design people have tried to put on the table probably would be there in the, on the front burner for science. What I do think is valuable is, once again, kind of thinking not so much about the rarefied atmosphere in, in which academics live, but the, the culture, the population at large, there is so much of a kind of easy acceptance of every little sound bite that we're fed by television or that we see in movies or whatever. And so when people so quickly assume that, yep, I believe in creation, or yep, I believe in evolution, or yep, I believe in both, then we ought to encourage more debate. And it may be that if there is a silver lining in something like the Dover, Pennsylvania trial, it is that a debate happened and a, a judge wrote a good, uh, a, a good summary. And uh, as some of you were saying, there may even be a movie coming out of it that will inform uh, people even more. So that's, that's where, I, and I, I don't believe that just about this debate between religion and science. I also believe that's one of the good, thing about, good things, if there is a good thing at all, about the so-called culture wars, or one of the good things when Democrats and Republicans actually get together and duke it out and deepen the discussion, which often doesn't happen, but sometimes those conflicts are actually good. Yeah, I, 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 I oh. want to, uh, uh, sir, I'll, I'll be very quick, Al. Okay. Um, I, I want to say that, that I think this is a moment of great opportunity. You might say it's the best of times, worst of times. In catastrophe theory, you can sometimes reach a point at which suddenly the, the situation will snap one way or another. I think we are, I think the debate is good from the point of view that w we have a great opportunity to popularize science, to strengthen understanding of science, and strengthen support for science among the American people. It doesn't have to go that way. That's why I think it's, we're at the crux. But I think ultimately, those of us in the scientific community, like Lawrence and I, who've been very outspoken on this issue, see this not just as an unfortunate distraction from our laboratory work, but as a great opportunity to increase public understanding and support for science. Sorry, Albert. Well, I think it's, um, the debate is not only healthy, it's really essential in that um, I'm inclined to think the real debate here is not between religion and science at all, but between naturalism and religion, religion and naturalism. These are two basically very different ways of looking at the world. There really is a deep conflict there. There really is a deep debate there. And science gets kind of co-opted, sometimes by one side, sometimes by the other. People like Dennett and Dawkins try to enlist science in the, uh, um, in the service of naturalism. I think totally mistakenly, but they do that. On the other side, the creationists, um, their issues are really religious. What they're really interested in, what they're really against is naturalism and evolution. Uh, and so they want to they frame the issue as a scientific issue when it really isn't that at all. It's a different kind of issue. It's a kind of deep religious issue. And it's very important that this debate continue. It's very important in part because lots and lots of people's, um, I don't know, psychological, spiritual health depends on this. Lots of Christians around the country, and I happen to be uh, one myself, but lots of them are 
um, deeply disturbed by the thought that maybe science has shown, is showing or has shown or will shown that this is all a mistake. There really uh, isn't any such person as God. There isn't any such thing as providence. There's nothing like that. And it's important that uh, we get really clear about that. Does science show that or not? I think science doesn't, uh, doesn't even begin to show that. It doesn't even make an, uh, any steps in that direction. It's not that kind of a thing at all. It seems to me instead, from that point of view, from the Christian perspective, we should think of science, Christians should think of it as trying to figure out how God's world works, this world that he's made. Now, how exactly do these various parts fit together? It might very well be that it's by virtue of some evolutionary process that, or even one involving natural selection and random genetic mutation that he created beings such as us, whom he wanted to create. If so, fine. But the important thing is to, is to see what the, what the bearing of science is on, the, on these uh, two deeply divergent ways of looking at the world. I, this is one place where I really agree with you. Uh, oh, good. Uh, uh, in a really important sense, I think that, that there, are, right there, there are a lot of... No. <laughs> yeah, there, there are, precisely because there are a lot of people who fear that science may one day prove that God doesn't exist, they should understand. One of the, and, and this relates to what, what Ken said. There is an opportunity here to explain what science is and what it isn't. And, that's, and both are important. It's really important to explain the limits of science what science cannot do. It's, it's very important to explain to scientists, by the way, as much as, as, much as anyone else, because there is a lot of hubris. As, as, as I said earlier, physicists are, are perhaps the worst examples of that. And, but, so there's an opportunity to show that science has limits to what it can talk about, and that's important for scientists as well as lay people, but at the same time, it's also in the best of worlds, and I don't think we're in the best of worlds, is an opportunity to provide people a chance to think about science. And in Kansas, for example, for me, one of the great byproducts of that, that, those problems, and I, I went to Kansas many times, I'm going again in a few months, is the outgrowth of things such as Kansas Citizens for Science, where parents got together and realized, you know what? This is an outgrowth. What's happening in Kansas is an outgrowth of the fact that people don't understand science. We should get into our schools and produce better science curricula. So, Part of the reaction to this, I think, it will be to, to do just what you said, which is to try and get people to realize, gee, we better do a better job of, even if parents have to get involved in the schools of teaching science. Did you want to jump in, Ron? Yeah, I have a question I'm, for you. I'm a little less uh, positive <coughs> than my colleagues here. Uh, I think we need a lot more discussion and maybe a little less debate. I think that uh, the democratic system is not a good way to solve these issues and that, that they get polarized unnecessarily. I think they create stereotypes about who's religious and what Christians believe, what scientists believe or not. And I think it has, these debates over, over evolution have spilled over uh, into debates about stem cell research and other things and, and has unnecessarily and unproductively politicize things. So I think there's a real downside to having a Donnybrook over science and religion, as well as maybe some of these opportunities. And won't that become worse? I mean, stem cell research, genetic manipulation, I mean, it's the use to which science is put that a, a lot of Americans find threatening or troubling, though, I suppose, Lawrence, as you pointed out, whenever there's a problem, then they want to bring in the scientists to solve it. But, but it's going to get a lot worse. How should science handle that? I mean, that's that's not going to get less threatening to believers, quote unquote. It's going to get more threatening when you start talking about playing with the genetic. The, the, what we have to do is, and this is what sciences don't do well enough, and it's one of the reasons you know I'm involved a lot in trying to explain science, and is that the only way it seems to me is to explain what science is about. We have to do a better job, and scientists have in general up till recently done a miserable job of explaining what science is and what we're doing. And we have to do that because if you are bothered by stem cells now, just wait. It's going to get infinitely worse. It's going to, it's, we're going to be, I'm convinced, we're going to, you know, in this century, not only are we going to be creating life out of, out of nothing, out of organic materials, we're, uh, but we're going to, it's going to be worse. I happen to think that probably with, within the next century, computers will become sentient and that we'll have to address the issue of our, our biological future will have to be coupled to, to computers because once they're self-programmable, there's no way that biological evolution will be able to compete. And so we'll, whether we become Borg or something else, it's not. But there, these, all these issues are going to become dramatically in, the next, in this century are going are to be there. And unless we start preparing people's minds now by explaining what, what's happening in science, 
scientists shouldn't be making the decisions. I mean, the public in a democracy, the public has to. But in a but in a democracy, for it to work, the public has to be informed, and and that's the vital thing. We have to not censor information, but do a really good job of trying to explain things so people can anticipate what's going to happen and make rational decisions for society's good. Now, we, we've only been talking for 50 minutes, and it took a long time for Lawrence to get Star Trek in here. <laughs> I'm contractually obliged. I have to. But, I, I, but he did. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking of the Borg, resistance is futile, so forth. So, um, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit in terms of scientific prognosis, and I'm going to do it not from the point of view of a physical scientist, from a biological scientist. I think, um, and, and stem cell research is going to be my model, my example. The, the, the debate about stem cell research really involves, embryonic stem cell research really regards, regards the status of the human embryo. In other words, what sort of status of personhood do we assign to the embryo? Um, and many people uh, who would put themselves in the pro-life camp because they regard the human embryo as sacrosanct, therefore oppose embryonic stem cell research. But I think the interesting thing about this, and a number of people have worked on this and worked on this very hard. Uh, good, one good example is William Hurlbut, who is an ethicist of biology at Stanford University. And Bill has worked very hard to try to find a technological and an ethical end run around the objections to stem cell research. Now, we have the first hints of that actually showing up in actual experimentation. And I remember sitting down, no kidding, with a couple of bishops and talking to them about the issue of stem cell research. And I pointed out that every eight weeks, somebody sticks a needle in my arm and they take blood cells, cells out of my body, in order to do research with them or isolate clotting factors or give them a transfusion to somebody else. Got any moral objections to that? The answer is, of course not. It's a good thing. You're doing a public service. Well, OK. Um, I then explained to the bishops what a blastocyst was. And I explain a blastocyst, which is an early stage in all mammalian embryonic development, in which you have an envelope of cells, most of which will become extra embryonic membranes, not part of a person. And then a little cluster of cells known as the inner cell mass. This is the cluster that will actually become the person or the embryo. Um, and we knew years ago from experiments on mice that you could open the blastocyst, tease out a cell, grow that in a petri dish. That's an embryonic stem cell, by the way. Seal up the blastocyst, throw it back into a uterus, and you know what? You get a perfectly healthy, happy mouse. How is that morally different from me donating a cell at the Rhode Island Blood Center as opposed to anything else? It hasn't destroyed the individual. Well, they, had, they, they, they reacted to that in a rather positive way because they realized that the people who are promoting embryonic stem cell research are not mad scientists or monsters, but rather they want to, to, uh, to advocate the moral good of a, uh, alleviating human pain, disease, and suffering. But they still worried, and I think they were right to, about the status of the embryo left behind. And one of them asked me a really tough question. They said, that's fine. Suppose you and your wife were trying to conceive by in vitro fertilization, and that blastocyst was the one that was going to be implanted into your wife to become your son or daughter. Would you allow somebody to go in with a needle and poke around? And I thought, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and he said, that's exactly the point. But I'm really quite optimistic that in a very short period of time, because of the rate at which we are understanding the developmental signals that go govern cellular differentiation, that the need to, to basically swipe a couple cells from the embryo that have learned tricks that we can't yet understand and use those for stem cell theories, I think eventually that's going to become unnecessary. And it will become unnecessary because we will understand more of the developmental biology. So I'm optimistic that science is going to solve technologically some of these moral dilemmas uh, in addition to foisting new ones on us. Well, Let me just throw one other thought and then we'll go to questions. Ron, somebody said in a question today that was here we've all talked about what science needs to do to better inform the public about what science is, but what about theology? I mean, and, and as one questioner said, you know, most people, their, their knowledge of theological, Christian thinking or whatever kind of thinking it is, is sort of frozen whenever they left Sunday school at age 12. And that because we don't teach religion in the schools, which we don't, that there's not even teaching of comparative religions or the evolution of religious thought in, in one um, faith or another. Is, as an historical matter, is, our, is the level of public understanding of religion less than it was, say, 100 years ago, or in the 20s, or other times where this debate was roiling? And do you think that's a problem? You're asking me? Yeah. yeah. I think so. I, uh, just in, in my years of teaching, I think uh, familiarity with the Bible, for example, is, has gone down to the point of almost non-existence. 
uh, these days. Uh, I don't want to unnecessarily offend any theologians here, but occasionally I dip into the theology of this subject. It's not going to help anybody. Uh, the, the theology dealing with science and religion today, with few exceptions, Jack Hott being one of the major ones, I think, is so esoteric and so removed from the interests of any normal person uh, that uh, being theologically ignorant is not necessarily a big handicap. <laughs> Alvin, I have to go to you on this. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I think that's a, a little a uh, little strong, maybe a little over the top. As long as uh, they're sophisticated philosophically, I meant. All right, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I think there are writers um, uh, who think about this and whose work is not all that unduly complicated, hard to follow. John Polkinghorne to be one example. And it seems to me it's all, it, it, but it seems to me Ron is right that the level of sort of theological, or maybe theological isn't the right word, of uh, sort of uh, religious competence or literacy is also very low. I mean, people have been complaining about scientific illiteracy. I think there is uh, also a very low level of religious literacy among, uh, say, entering college students. At the University of Notre Dame, where I teach, um, many students display uh, an almost appalling and, in fact, extremely impressive lack of knowledge of uh, the Catholic, Catholic theology, Catholic doctrine, Catholic tradition. They know next to nothing about it except that Notre Dame is a Catholic university with a dandy football team. So, <laughs> so I think that that's a real problem. I think, uh, as I was saying early on, I thought, I thought it's important that these issues be discussed. I don't mean debated, but discussed, and that Christians come first of all to learn exactly what it is, the, where their interests as Christians lie, just what it is uh, they actually do believe in, how that fits in with various other parts of the world, various, in particular with science. Uh, I think that's um, one of the main desiderata. And um, I don't know where this education is really going to come from. It's not going to come in public schools. Maybe students who go to private schools, Catholic schools, and also Protestant schools are, uh, have a somewhat better chance along these lines. But even there in Catholic schools, from which many Notre Dame students come, it seems to me there's an absolutely appalling lack of knowledge of the whole thing. Well, I think there's, well, let me just take the other side. I know you want to go to questions, but well, I, I... Let I, me just say, if people think they want to ask questions, why don't you go ahead and you can go to the mics. Go I ahead. think there is an appalling lack of literacy, generally, but, but I think the people are... To be, you know, I know there's this thing that somehow the Christians are under attack in our society today, and I just think it's just nonsense. Uh, I think, you know, we, we, in particular, and I'm not Christian, uh, it, it's everywhere. It, it's everywhere. You can't help but be bombarded by, and it's pretty non-sophisticated theology, I'll give you that. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's, the, it's the real world view of, you know, and by real world I mean the TV show uh, level of, of, of theology. But it's everywhere, from the President of the United States to everywhere, you're bombarded with notions of God and the Christian worldview. And so it may not be sophisticated, but I think it's... Um, it's uh, to say that it's disappearing is, is not correct. All right, we're going to go to questions. We can write here. And if, again, um, if you would please state your name and uh, affiliation. Thanks. Mary Evelyn Tucker at the Institution for Social and Policy Studies, but I'm also a historian of um, the religions of East Asia and, and the intellectual history of East Asia. Um, and a long-term interest in this topic, so I thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I would just like to invite into the discussion, and it's been part of the background, clearly, um, even though we've been focusing mostly on the U.S. for obvious reasons, but a little bit of pluralism might liven up this discussion and certain distinctions, especially about science, about religion, and about Christianity in particular. And I would just invite us, uh, Ken said just a few minutes ago that there was no science outside of the West, and I think we all know... No, I, I didn't say that. Okay, no experimental science. No, I said experimental science became developed in the West. Yes, okay. I do think, though, for a larger sense of the background of this discussion, Needham's work on China, um, on science and technology in China would be hugely of interest. And as a number of you have said, this is not a problem, certainly in East Asia and many parts of the world, the way science has been accepted and developed. And I think that would be of significant agriculture, irrigation systems, uh, urban development, medicine, and so on. So I just wanted to put that into the discussion. I don't think we we would probably not disagree with that. But 
as far as religion goes, when Alvin said um, in his talk that religion is dealing with um, contact with the supernatural, again, I would invite us simply to have some pluralism here. Confucianism has um, no interest in, in, in the supernatural, so to speak, nor does Buddhism. Um, and I think these are religions that also need to be part of, of our thinking. Um, and in fact, the majority of the world's religions are not involved with exclusive claims to truth. Um, this only rests within certain forms of the Western traditions. I think this changes the nature of the discussion. And finally, I think when we come to Christianity, um, I think what's unfortunate that it's not been part of the discussion is that Christianity is identified with Alvin's talk with theism that immediately implies design. I don't think is descriptive of some of the most interesting, thoughtful reflections in Christianity that are coming out of process philosophy and process theology, resting on Whitehead, or Hot is resting on Teilhard, and so on. But I think what's particularly interesting and exciting to, to enter into the discussion, it gives us perhaps some of the most fertile grounds for actually suggesting that creativity is within the processes of evolution, not something entering from outside. And that the notion of emergence um, in these processes that people like Terry Deacon at uh, Berkeley are, are dealing with give us some grounds for what Gordon Kaufman, the theologian at the Divinity School at Harvard, would call serendipitous creativity that there's self-organization, uh, creativity, but there's also serendipity. I'm sorry that right, was yep. so long. Sorry. <laughs> let, let me just, Ron, we actually had discussed, we've been discussing this in the Carters for two days, which is other religions, and Ron, you had some things that you were going to talk about, about oh, address I, that. I, about, I would like to, to second the call for uh, extending this discussion beyond Christianity. Most of it has focused uh, not just here, but I'm talking about generally uh, uh, about Christianity. And I think because a lot of the conflict has taken place in Christian cultures, uh, unfortunately, uh, it is spreading around the world into Muslim cultures. Uh, Korea is a hot center for science and religion debate, in part because there's so many Presbyterians over there now. Uh, but Asia is not escaping this in the way that it, that it did. Uh, and... Uh, there, there are projects underway at present to explore the relationship between science and the world religions uh, in a more systematic way. If any, it, I wonder if I could yes, respond. please. I'd like to respond to uh, to what that uh, what was just said. Um, I'm not sure that Confucianism is best thought of as a religion, as opposed to a, a proposal for a certain kind of way of life. And it's often not thought of as a religion. I mean, that's, just, that's not just a peculiarity of my own way of thinking about it. And as for, I mean, I agree with the speaker. Certainly, it would be wonderful to extend the discussion. The problem is um, we all live where we do, and it's pretty hard to get a really good handle on what, you know, what's going on right around us. Um, it's, it's wonderful to go beyond that, but it's not surprising that uh, we living here concentrate on what we find around us. And as for Buddhism, um, I mean, I think she was suggesting that not nearly all religions are theistic. That's, uh, that's correct. But it's not the case that Buddhism in general isn't. Certain kinds of Buddhism are, and certain kinds, certain kinds are not. And some are sort of, sort of such that it's just really hard to tell whether they are or are not. And then there was also a suggestion that only Christianity, or maybe only Christianity, but and certainly not all the other religions, make exclusive truth claims. I mean, if an exclusive truth claim is just the claim, is a claim like this, that if a certain proposition P is true, then any proposition incompatible with P is false, I would think everybody would make exclusive truth claims so construed. If an exclusive truth claim instead of something like this, that um, uh, my religion is true and no other religion has any truth in it at all, then I, I don't think there are many religions at all, certainly not Christianity, that would make claims like that. And finally, as for uh, Whitehead and the like not involving design, I guess that's right. Um, but it's not really clear that that part of Whitehead's philosophy is Christian. Whitehead himself didn't claim that it was. And um, I don't know, I don't know of any good reason to think that in fact it is. 
Ron, one thing that I think, I will just expand upon what you said, since we're talking about other religions, I think it's important to realize that the, that the well, you said it's spreading to Islam. I think you're being overly politically correct. I think, I think uh, it, that's one of the big, big problems with Islam, has it been far less uh, tolerant of science and, in fact, a, 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 any kind of blasphemy for over the last few years. And so I think it's, it's certainly an area, just, it's, it's fundamentalist Islam is, has been, for a while, just as obnoxious as fundamentalist Christianity in terms of its uh, um, uh, fear of knowledge. Oh, worse, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And one of the problems there is that the creationist and intelligent design people in the Muslim community are presenting themselves as progressives yeah. because they're engaging science exactly. as opposed to the, to the fundamentalist Muslims who won't even touch the subject. Yeah, yeah. Right. The next questioner. I, and I, if, if, excuse me, but if there's someone in particular you want to direct the question to, just let us know. And otherwise, I won't ask anyone who wants to speak can, but we want to get to every question. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Morris, a student at Yale here. Um, and I was struck by what Mr. Krauss said earlier about how um, scientists, when they're doing their experimentations for quite uh, uh, recognizable reasons, don't really spend that much time thinking about philosophy or theological questions. Um, but I was wondering, for the rest of us who have to think about things like ethics, um, <laughs> the, uh, we do every now and then, too. <laughs> it, it, it seems that there might be a theoretical problem on uh, basing how to base one's ethics, or can a system of ethics be based on naturalism? And it seems that a lot of philosophers and theologians have come up with a negative conclusion to that answer. So I would ask you, um, what is the basis for your ethics, and how would you, I mean, do you think that uh, Darwinism is a compatible ethic for society? It, it's a, that's a very good question. I think, um, I think there's an important distinction between ethics and morality, okay? I think that, I tried to, in my lecture yesterday, I don't know if you were here, talk about the scientific ethos. I think we, in fact, now pretty well most science departments that I know of have make an effort to talk about ethics. Uh, ethics of the profession. It's based on honesty, as I said before, egalitarianism, uh, non-authoritarianism, uh, uh, complete disclosure. It's, I mean, it, there's an ethos there that, that I think is profoundly um, important and, in fact, um, needs not, I, I cannot see how any appeal to God or anything else would affect it or would be useful. I would also, by the way, go beyond that, and I think I, I I agree certainly here with Richard Dawkins that even if one goes beyond ethics to morality, the claim that you need religion for morality is specious in my opinion. And, uh, uh, but certainly in the case of ethics, professional ethics and science, this, the field progresses by being ethical. And, and if it's unethical, then it doesn't progress. I think it's, it's just, uh, I, I, don't see the, I don't see the need to, to require a higher intelligence in nature or any purpose to the world to define how you proceed with the, the, the process of science, which is really you know, what, just, what scientists do. They just go out and do things. They're not supposed to lie. They're not supposed to cheat. They're not supposed to partially pick the data. Uh, they're not supposed to steal other people's data. And there's lots of ethics that, that the, and the reason it's done is not because of some higher, well, it's because we want to proceed to try and understand the way the world works. And it doesn't work effectively if you do those things. It just doesn't work. Whenever, whenever you try and censor or lie or cheat, it's the sci science, Dies, and when you ever, if you ever seen societies that require that, um, for political or theological or philosophical reasons, science has, has not progressed. If you look at genetics in the Soviet Union and, at, at certain times, and 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 so, I think it's really important to talk about ethics. And you're absolutely right that scientists, I think, have only become recently more aware of the need to discuss that, probably because of some so many unethical things have been happening lately in science. Uh, but certainly one doesn't have to appeal, I think, to, to religion or, or um, divine intelligence to do that, in my opinion. No one wants to disagree? All right, right here. Uh, I'm Mike Rota. I'm, I'm doing a postdoc at Harvard on science and religion. Um, I have a question for Dr. Krauss about uh, the statement that science makes God invisible. And uh, I, I have in mind one thing that someone might mean by that, and I don't think it's what you mean, but I wanted to check. Here's what one, th one thing someone might mean by saying science makes God invisible, is this, science shows or suggests 
that no one really has any rational grounds to believe in God. Um, would you, th do you think that's true or false? Well, that's an interesting statement. Um, I think um, uh, in one sense, yes. Let me, let me qualify what I said. I don't think so science, in order to be compatible with religion, I think science, God has to be invisible or and let me point out, this is really important, we all say science can't disprove the existence of God, but science could prove the existence. If tomorrow the stars realign themselves to say, I am here, for example, I think you'd find many astronomers and many physicists suddenly saying, you know, maybe there's something to, to be explored here. <laughs> and, and, and so I think there's certainly many possibilities for positive evidence for God. There aren't any that I know of, but that doesn't mean there won't ever be. But, the, but so... In that sense, God has been invisible. But, I, but getting to your other question of, of, of is there a rational reason, if you, you mean is there any evidentiary reason to require the existence of God, the answer is no. I, 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 happen, that's, that, I think that's clear. But, but it is a long, big leap from there to say the fact that there's no evidentiary reason to require the existence of God to saying there's no evidentiary reason there's no reason to assume the existence of God is, is impossible. I think, that, I think that's, that's science at this point does not go that far, and it's a huge mistake to suggest that science requires you to be irrational to believe there is some purpose to the universe. Uh, I differ from some of my colleagues in that, but I don't see it, even though I may personally believe it. Yes. Hi, my name is Steve Stearns. I'm a professor here of evolutionary biology. I teach the freshman evolutionary biology. I'm an atheist materialist. My wife is a believing Christian. We're having our 35th very happy wedding anniversary pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed that about six weeks into the course, I, I, by the way, I usually offer to have lunch with the students after the lecture. About six weeks into the course, a couple of students will ask to go to lunch, and they'll sit me down, and they'll say, okay, Professor Stearns, you've been kidding around with us. You've been calling us big old bags of molecules, and you've been explaining why we might be cooperative or altruistic and all this other stuff, but tell me really, what is the meaning of life? And that's happened to me now regularly, and so I want to know how you will answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you, you get paid for teaching your course. Why do we have to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> he wants to have some answers to choose there, there's, from. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll give you uh, Ray Bradbury's answer. Um, and there's a wonderful line in the Martian Chronicles, um, which, which I'm sure you know. It's just, if you haven't read Martian Chronicles, read it. It's just a wonderful book. Yeah, it's just a wonderful book. And at one point in there, um, the Martians have sort of disappeared, taken themselves out of sight as a result of an invasion and colonization of people from Earth. And uh, the Earth people eventually do stupid things that as people do to each other and pretty much destroy the environment of Mars and the planet Earth and everything else. And then the Martians reappear. And there's an insight in the narrative of the novel that basically says that one of the things that the Martians were puzzled about was that the Earth creatures were always debating the meaning of life and the purpose of existence. And people on Mars or individuals on Mars instinctively knew that the purpose of life was to be alive and left it at that. Um, and I, th I, and I, I think that's as good an answer that, that will satisfy people's faith as, as well as people who, who do not have some sort of religious faith. Ron, Bob. Uh, as somebody who once could answer that question very precisely, but who has no answer for that now, all I can say is that I deeply sympathize with the people. It's, it's a lot nicer to be able to answer that question in some concrete way than to have to live with the, the knowledge or lack of knowledge about what, if there is ultimate meaning to life, which is what I live with now all the time. No, just briefly, it amused me that they would come to you. I mean, I un understand why, but uh, I mean, if I was a student, I don't think I would come, come to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, let, let me... Let, let me go beyond that. I, I think it's, it, it's really important that you indicate that, that you're the wrong person to ask in the sense that when people, I, people often ask me that, they often ask me when I talk what my religious beliefs are in general. And I say, what does it mean? I, I, you know, as a scientist, I have no special knowledge 
about the meaning of life or, or the existence of God. I mean, I'll tell you my personal beliefs, but it should be irrelevant to you. It's as useful as your own personal beliefs. It's not something I have any special expertise for. So I would say, I would say as a scientist, you, don't, you, have, you, you, have, you have, in principle, expertise about how the world works, but that's as far as it goes. Alvin. Well, I think, um, the, I mean, I sort of know what these students, what they have in mind, right? I mean, they think this way of looking at the world um, deprives life of meaning. I sort of know what they mean, but only sort of. What exactly, what is it for life to have a meaning? I mean, that would be a really interesting question to, to try to figure this out in some detail. It's the sort of thing philosophers like to think about, I mean, instead maybe of uh, more important things. But anyway, what, what would it mean to say that life has a meaning and what would it mean that, to say that it doesn't? There would be some good examples. People think it would, uh, that if life, that if, for example, Christianity is true or, or Judaism or Islam or something like that, then life has a meaning. But if uh, materialism is true and all there are, are atoms whirling in the void a la Democritus and the like, then life doesn't have a meaning. But what, what would it be for it to have a meaning exactly? I mean, uh, in a way, if, if I were in your shoes, I would say, um, could you explain the question? <laughs> that, that presumption of yours that if we're just a bunch of molecules, life doesn't have meaning, I think is many of us would disagree with who tend to think we're just a bunch of molecules. I, st I, I think it's life is a meaning. You know, we have this amazing, just un it's amazing that we can think and we, and we ought to, and, and what, what we should do with life is utilize that, that, that very short and amazing ability to its maximum uh, to, and enjoy it. Yeah, we certainly ought to think, right? <laughs> yes. Hi, yeah, Rick Prum in uh, Ecology and Evolution. Uh, we've seen uh, a whole perspective of uh, mostly pessimistic views on the future, where we're headed. Uh, um, the scientists irritated the theologians, theologians irritated the scientists, the historians and sociologists told us why this is pretty intractable and might continue. Um, I want to you know, make a positive observation and then ask you about, about a solution. Um, as an ornithologist, I thought that you know, the, the uh, penguin movie that was all the rage was, was, was amazing. And then I found out that it was the subject of a sort of Christian creationist cult following. And I thought, wow, maybe, maybe we, you know, through our appreciation for penguins, we'd have a lot more in common. I'd, like, I'd love to have them sit in my ornithology class and learn, you know, a little bit more about penguins. And I think we could uh, come to some commonality. Uh, evolutionary biologists are people who are motivated by awe uh, and to use their brains. And uh, uh, as a lifelong bird watcher, I've never had to ask what the purpose of uh, life was. You know, the life list, observing birds, learning about that. And that's where I think uh, a lot of academics, but evolutionary biologists are like, my mother-in-law finally figured me out when she said, I get it, you've got a calling. You know, and, 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 and feel good. I wasn't going into medicine uh, after that. Uh, my, <laughs> my, um, my question is about returning to Gould, who's been mentioned several times. Um, and I'm wondering what's wrong, really wrong, with his with his framework, because I think if you really look at the millennium scale of what's happened in how we think of reality or how we think of this experience we're having, that his solution of two magisteria, uh, one empirical and one spiritual, is, 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 is not only rational but stable. And the reason why it's stable is because uh, uh, you know, you, we won't have scientists meddling over in the spiritual realm telling us that God had does or does not exist. And you won't have a, a, um, a particular theologies getting into science, because as soon as theology gets into science, it's going to be a Christian theologian or a Hindu or an Islamic theologian. And, and, and that's going to be very offensive to a lot of science or to a lot of uh, to religions. So we have a real stable solution. And, and Ron described the, the magisteria as, as incomparable, and one very large, and the religious one is shrinking. But if, if it's really the cause of everything in the other one, of course, it's it's, it's going to be quite large. Uh, and, and, and I mean, I, and a religious person, I think, would experience that in faith, that that, that, that magisterium is, is, is magnificent and large. Uh, so I'd like, to, I'd like your, your responses to that, and why can't we um, try to promulgate that? The trouble, I think, with this is that at least most Christians in the United States, the majority, would feel like they were giving up too much to say that religion was no longer going to have anything to say about the natural world. When the Bible tells them this is what happened, uh, it's, 
it may be stable and attractive. It's very prescriptive. It doesn't describe what the majority of Christians think religion encompasses. And so it's unrealistic. That's all I'm saying. And, and are would they you not, say not, subject to the instability that was pointed out in the, the, the quote from... Uh, uh, from uh, uh, Augustine about how it's it, it, basing a, a religion upon uh, suppositions that are falsifiable by going to nature is kind of an unstable way to build. Don't, 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 don't fight with the facts, you know. I'd ask them, you know, are you going to get last year's flu shot or are you going to get this year's? Well, we've had a bunch of evolutionary biologists designing the flu shot that's going to work this year. Uh, the, the, and, I can and, assure and, you that neither quoting Augustine or referring to flu shots will get you anywhere with yeah. these people. It's yeah, just, uh, I also well, think it's, and, and, it's, and let me, it, let, it's let, nice, but unrealistic in another sense, that it, it, it I, I wish it were that way, but then the question is, are you saying there's certain questions you can't ask? For example, can you not, if you're a scientist, ask questions about spirituality, about the evolutionary nature of spirituality, the psychological nature of spirituality, or... Or, uh, I mean, so at some point it's a nice cop out, but I think ultimately it's a cop out. Even the scientific description of spirituality is not the experience of spirituality. And, and, and that magisterium is about that experience. I mean, about I, which about science. Rick, could, Rick, no. Rick I, I, would, I would argue I, I, li I have a superficial attraction for Gould's solution because it makes peace. Yeah. It reminds me of something that Ian Barber once said, a very distinguished scholar of science and religion. And he said that both. I'm going to get the word order right here. Both the scientific materialist, person who says science disproves God, and the scientific creationist um, uh, misuse science and religion. One makes statements about um, science that are dictated by religious beliefs. That's the creationist. The other one makes, seeks to make religion a part of science, and that's the scientific materialist, and both of them are wrong. Um, and I would argue that the, the biggest problem I have with NOMA, the non-overlapping magisteri, is it argues against the unity of knowledge. And I think ultimately knowledge ought to be one in one sense or another. And I, I want to quickly address the first thing you said about all these pessimistic views up here. Um, and I've written about this. Uh, but, but Brown is a small enough school. Um, this wouldn't come as a shock at Yale, but if I was at Michigan State, it would. Brown is small enough that I actually know people in other departments. Ooh, okay. Um, and I remember uh, once, not very long ago, having a whole bunch of people over dinner at our house, and we drank a lot of wine. And as a result of that, we started to talk about really stupid things. And one of the stupid things was, if you could live any time in history and be alive, what time would you pick? Okay, so this went around the table. And there was a philosopher there. And the philosopher said, no offense, Alvin, that <laughs> the most interesting time to be alive would have been ancient Greece during the academy with Plato and Aristotle and so forth. And since then, philosophy, straight downhill. Um, my, my wife... <laughs> My wife, who was an artist, said she wanted to live in Paris in the 1880s during the birth of the Impressionist movement because she thought that was the single most creative period and creative place in art and so forth and so on. Gordon Wood, who's a very distinguished scholar of the American Revolution, said, who's worked on the revolution his whole life, he would have liked to have lived during the revolution so he could write about it from direct. It is went on and on. And then all of a sudden, people realized that there are four, four scientists in the room, and none of us had said a thing. And finally they said, well, okay, why don't you guys speak up? And we all started to look at each other, and we smiled, and we started to giggle, and we realized we all had the same answer, which is for anyone involved in science, the most exciting time in human history to be alive is now. And I consider that to be a profoundly optimistic notion. Maybe tomorrow. I'd say not I'll now, but I'd rather <laughs> <like> tomorrow. <laughs> I would always like to be alive tomorrow. One last comment. Hey, like let respond. Alvin, because we, we do have other people. I'd here. like to respond, too, uh, to, uh, to uh, your question about Gould. I think um, I, I, don't, I don't see much, uh, much merit in it at all. I mean, basically, it's not just that he says we'll hand, the religionists should hand over the whole natural world to, uh, to the scientists. What he really says is there are two kinds of, um, two kinds of propositions in the world factual propositions and normative or evaluative propositions. Religion deals with the former, science deals with the latter. Well, this seems to me to be completely wrong. I mean, any religions that I know of, or at least the vast majority of religions, make very impressive factual claims. For example, Christianity says in Buddhism, I mean Christianity and uh, the other Abrahamic religions, Islam and Judaism, there is this great being, omnipotent, omniscient, and holy good who created the whole world. And um, we owe him allegiance and the like of that. I mean, that's an enormous factual statement. It's about as big a factual statement as you want to cross. So if you really take what he says seriously, um, not even things like that would, I mean, even things like that would be outside the pale of religion. Religion could only deal with values. It could only say what's good and what's bad and how people ought to live and this and that. 
But I mean, that seems to me to be a, to, to be just totally unrealistic. It's, it, it would really completely eviscerate any kind of religion. And as a matter of fact, Gould tries to enlist the Pope on his side, of all people. Um, and there, if you take a careful look at what he says, it seems to me he just, he's just wildly off the mark. The Pope wouldn't believe that for a minute. And I'm with the Pope, despite being a Calvinist. <laughs> <laughs> Say Dross, History of Science. Um, given the degree of scientific illiteracy that we're dealing with in, with this whole debate, and given that um, at least at the high school and, and early college level, creationists and intelligent design supporters tend to have actually a better understanding of the relevant science than sort of the general that age population. Might it be a boon for science in the long run, the, success, the current successes of intelligent design, either here or in, for example, Islamic countries that have so much resistance to science altogether? I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a, it's, it's a boon. I would go so far as to say it's a great opportunity. And I also, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Islamic critics of evolution, who include a Turkish writer named, who writes under the pen name of Harun Yaha, um, have actually asked his uh, Islamic, and, and one of the fun things about this is, and I got a kick out of this, is that Harun Yaha presents, you'll love this, presents evolution as a Christian plot to subvert the morals of Islamic youth. So think about evolution as a Christian plot. It's just delightful. I love to think about that. Um, but the interesting thing is, as was pointed out, that Harun Yaha actually tells his Islamic youth to consider science. And he says science upholds the Quran and so forth and so on. But from my point of view, especially considering the fact that the Islamic world in a way led in science through about the 14th or 15th century and has essentially abandoned it in modern times. Anything that gets the Islamic world seriously talking about science is probably a good thing. And as I said, I don't think it's, the controversy has been a boon to science, but I think it's a, it's a moment of great opportunity. And I think such moments are not to be wasted. Well, I would, again, I think you're being a little too optimistic. I, I agree with you. I mean, every problem is an opportunity. The global warming presents us a great opportunity to become more energy efficient. And, but I wish we didn't have to confront the huge problem that we're about going to have to front. And I, in this case, it would be, I think there might be much more productive ways to talk about the wonder of nature and get people excited about the world than having to do it in a negative way and to, to combat a, a, a sort of a, a misunderstanding. Uh, it, it's much better, it seems to me, to be positive than negative. And so you're right, it's an opportunity, but I, I think it's to be a lot better opportunities than I wish I had. Um, I want to try to bring this in on time, which we're going to miss a little. So could I ask you both to ask your questions and then... And then People here can address them both, or either. Sure. sure. My name is Aaron Mertz. I'm a first-year graduate student in the Department of Physics here at Yale, and I must admit I'm a little disheartened by the number of by the small number of students in the audience here today. And my question is to professors Krauss and Miller: um, What can, or at what point in their careers could scientists, whether as, uh, aspiring or established, begin to engage these issues, especially as related to the public understanding of science, and what can they do? Okay. Good That's a good question. And if I, just the other question, then we'll... Thank you. David Neuheiser, University of Oxford. I have two quick questions for both, uh, both for professors uh, Miller and Plantinger. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the limits of science, but I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about the limits of theology and to uh, take the discourse onto another level. I was um, somewhat concerned about the, uh, the nature of divine action and causality that was envisioned in, in both of your talks, and I'd, and I'd like you to expand upon that. First, um, Professor Plantinga, I, I was concerned that um, your, your talk about God guiding um, the process of, uh, uh, of evolution at points might imply that um, God's activity is a cause which might be on the same level with a natural cause. But I, and, I, and I'm concerned that this might um, buy into the antagonism um, between science and religion that the, um, the antagonists in this debate uh, have been promulgating. And... and uh, Professor Miller, I, I was wondering if you envision at, at points in your lecture that science and religion might ask different sorts of questions. I wonder whether you think that science is theologically relevant, which is to say, do you think that um, objective inquiry into the natural world can tell us things about God? That's, 
See, let me uh, answer yours first, because then we can move over to that table to answer the, the both questions. Um, so your question, uh, it's, it's a really good question, and I, I, I think that, uh, but my advice to young scientists, it, it, especially if they're good, is to do science. Uh, that's, really, that's where you're going to have, the, if, if you have a talent and an ability and an interest and excitement, you should be doing that to the greatest extent you can. But of course, we're, if you have, and I suspect you do from the way you asked the question, uh, you have to be true to your own interests. And we are citizens, and it's extremely important for those scientists, and I don't think every scientist needs to do this. I don't think every scientist should spend their time doing some of the things that I do, for example. But if it's, if it's within, inside you, you, you have a great opportunity as you do science to, to have an impact on society as a citizen. And so that will continue to grow. But, but I, I really think that young scientists should, should to, to be doing, the best thing you can do is, is provide new knowledge about the world. And then as you do it, to disseminate it. And so uh, uh, it will, one will come with the other. But I think it's really important that, um, that you, you take whatever opportunities you have and they'll grow. I mean, you, you don't have to create them. You don't have to spend all of your time trying to, to, to you know, write articles or newspapers or whatever. But they'll grow with time. But, uh, but if your love is science, you should be doing science. Yeah, I, I want to concur completely with what Lawrence just said in terms of um, establish your career. Uh, move into science. It's the single most important thing that anybody can do. And while you're doing it, share your excitement and enthusiasm about science with your roommates, your friends, other people. Let, let them know that science, science is a draw. Um, you also started off by observing that there are very few students here. Um, I want to make an observation. Scheduling. Um, I spoke last week at the University of Kansas on the same topic. 650 people came, almost all of them students. Why was that? Is, is the student body at Kansas so much more interested in science than the student body at Yale? Well, maybe so. But I think the, the critical thing was talk was 7.30 in the evening. People didn't have to go to class. That's the, that's, that's the big thing. <laughs> and then the two yep. of you, if you could take yeah, one. Right. Um, this about guiding. Now, um, so I, what I was really saying was not that uh, I, I wasn't proposing, as a matter of fact, God does guide this evolutionary course. I say all I was saying so in my talk actually was this is perfectly possible. This could happen. Christians are committed to thinking that God in a very broad sense of guides, guides the evolutionary process where that very broad sense would include his setting up, uh, his setting up in advance certain kinds of mechanisms that he knows will issue in the sorts of results he wants. But whether this involves micromanaging, um, thumb, on the, thumb on the scale, as Margaret was saying, on the one hand, or his just arranging everything in advance so it's going to turn out the way he wants. On the other hand, that's a different question. Now, as to whether say, uh, Christians are committed, I, I think, to one or the other of these two ways of looking at it, uh, whether or not, and not just Christians, other theists, you suggest that might um, exacerbate the debate or exacerbate the problem. Um, well, I don't see why. I mean. Christians and others have a right to figure out what they want to think, you know, and if that's what, um, if that what, if that what's, what's, uh, what follows from theism and you're a theist, um, I don't think you have to worry that other people are going to disagree. Maybe some other people will disagree, but why don't you have a right to think it, you know, just as a naturalist has got a right to think he's a naturalist and to think naturalism is true. So I'm not sure the fact that some other people would disagree and hence there might be a, some kind of exacerbated debate, I, I'm not sure that's really relevant. I was actually wondering whether it's a confusion of the character of religious faith. Whether that's a confusion. To, to confuse divine activity with natural causation, or to say that they're the same sort of thing. Oh, yeah, you did, uh, right. So, um, so you could think of God as acting in two different ways. One way is acting directly. He himself directly does something, and if there are other creatures that act, then, from a theistic point of view, God must have created something or other directly. Maybe he created one thing which created another, which created another, and so on, but he has to, has to have created something directly. On the other hand, God uh, could act indirectly by creating creatures who do certain things. As far as I can see, there is no reason in the world to think that God couldn't act in both ways in his world. It's not as if, if he did something directly, he would be confusing I mean, it's not as if thinking that would be confusing God with a creature, seems to me. I mean, why can't God, um, as a non-creature, as a creator, act both ways? 
In fact, he's got to act the direct way at some point if there are to be any actions of the indirect way. I, I suppose, to just, just to bring it back to Professor Miller, that that raises the second question, which is would such action be identifiable, which is also to ask, is natural science theologically relevant? Right, I, I think natural science is theologically relevant because it tells us about the world which atheists believes God has created, and informing us about the nature of that world is theologically relevant and is important. Um, uh, unfortunately, and this is probably because I'm not a Calvinist, um, I'm going to reject both of the ways in which Dr. Plantinga just said God might work. And I wrote down, I hope I got them right, either by, he said Christians are either committed to a God that guides the evolutionary process or arranges thing in, things in advance so he knows how it's going to come out. Both of those actions deny creation a certain degree of independence in terms of things are fixed, the game is rigged, it's going to come out in a particular way. And I think the science that has emerged in the last hundred years, particularly in physics, has shown that the behavior of the natural world is profoundly indeterminate at its most basic level, not completely stochastic and random in chance, but, uh, but, but unable to be predicted in detail. And that's an extremely important theological point, which I think is relevant to theology. If you take a theological view of nature as God's creation, then it's perfectly obvious that that divine being has built in a kind of independence to the world so that things could not have been directly arranged in advance. And I would argue the central point of, 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 of Christian theology is that we have independence, that we have free will, that we are to a degree independent of the creator. And one of the things that Aquinas said basically is that a world that was devoid of chance, of things happening on their own, could never be truly independent of its creator. And therefore, I think the findings of modern science in this respect show that independence directly. Now, if you don't believe in God, you figure, okay, that's the way the world is. But if you do believe in God, what it tells you is that the creation has a degree of independence from the creator that makes moral choice possible, that makes your actions for the future relevant in the sense that the future is not rigged in advance, is not micromanaged by God, but you're going to have something to do with it. And that point of individual personal responsibility for what's going to happen to the world, I would argue, is a point on which people of faith and people who are atheists and agnostic can agree, which is to say what happens in this world now and the choices we make are relevant and are important and are worth thinking about. Could, could I say, make a very brief yes. rejoinder? Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, of course, I, th I, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Ken about the importance of moral choice and about human beings being independent of God in the sense that God creates them and then allows them to make certain choices and make them freely. Absolutely, I certainly concur with that. Uh, where I disagree with him is where I think he, and you'll excuse me, makes a certain confusion. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say that um, I can act freely. It's quite another thing to say that God won't, can't know in advance uh, what I'm in fact going to do. The fact that I will, in a few minutes, I will presumably freely walk out either that door or this door. I would say there's a truth about which one I will walk out of. The fact that there is a truth about that and that God in fact knows that truth doesn't seem to me for a minute to compromise my freedom in going the one way rather than the other. It's just that he knows what I will freely do. <laughs> and on that cosmic thought, I'm going to end this. Thank you all very much. Thank the organizers, the Terry Lecter, and our panelists. Thank you.